All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I see people are starting to trickle in, um, but it is 1 p.m. and so we're going to get started today. Um, before we start, I just wanted to have a few housekeeping items that we address. Um, to start, I wanna remind everyone that today's webinar will be recorded and we will be sharing a copy of the recording with everyone who's registered. And during this webinar, we encourage you to share any questions or comments that you have using our question and answer feature um, or the chat box. We will be checking for questions during the webinar and we'll have the opportunity to address them during our Q&A session at the end. And we'll also be sharing links to specific resources in the chat box. And so we encourage you to share any comments or ideas that uh, have worked well at your institution or your organization. So my name is Serena Fambale Crane, and I will be hosting today's webinar. A bit about me, I am the Senior Manager of Partner Success at Persistence Plus, and I've worked here for around three years. I'm a graduate of Penn Graduate School of Education, uh, and I worked in admissions and enrollment at colleges and universities in the Philadelphia region. On our panel today, we will be joined by Dr. Christine Mangino, Kevin Lee, and Dr. Ross O'Hara. So this is a surreal picture, uh, really sort of encapsulates this surreal time that we've been living in over the past few months. This is a picture from New York City in March of this year, uh, right as the country realized that we were in the beginning throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. We all watched as the city of New York jumped into action to combat coronavirus. And similarly, we witnessed colleges and universities all over the country jump into action to figure out how best to protect their students and transition them to distance learning. At Persistence Plus, we partner with several colleges and universities by leveraging behavioral science and artificial intelligence to design nudges that support student success and are delivered to students as text messages. And so when we reached out to our partners around mid-March just to really check in and see how things are going. And we found ourselves amazed by how quickly and efficiently they were able to make this transition. And so with the understanding that our entire way of engaging with students had to shift rapidly, we worked to corral our work to align some of our communications uh, with their on-campus efforts as well. And here we see a picture of New York that was taken three years ago, so a little bit different than uh, the previous picture. We're now seeing news stories from all over the country as communities are joining together and rallying around social causes and calls for justice. Along with COVID-19, we now have social movements and protests that have moved to the forefront of our national discussion. And so with all that's happening around the country, there's this great sense of uncertainty. Colleges and universities are trying to learn what their students wanna hear how their students want to hear it, and how to keep them engaged through these turbulent times. We're now seeing headlines about student needs, and colleges are having a lot of conversations about the most effective way to communicate with their students right now. But before we get into our discussion for the day, we'd like to hear from you all about uh, what some of your biggest challenges are. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you're currently facing in terms of communicating and engaging with your students? And so there is a poll that should be on your screen right now. If you'd like to participate and just share what's top of mind for you, really would like to get a sense of what you all are thinking. I see some people are voting, so we're just gonna take a few more seconds. We'll give it about five more seconds before we end the poll. And so on your screen, you'll see um, some of how the audience voted. Um, what we see is a lot of people saying students don't read messages. Um, students may not respond to messages. So that's something that we hear often at Persistence Plus. Um, are students not taking advantage of some of those resources? Um, if there were anything, if there was anything that um, you weren't able to vote on or there are other reasons, um, please share in the chat because we'd like to keep that conversation going. Mm -hmm. 
Next slide, please. And so for today's agenda, uh, we're going to uh, first hear from Dr. Ross O'Hara, who's going to talk about the effective communication strategies that we've learned from over 10 successful randomized trials that have shown how the right nudges can motivate students to engage with their college, take advantage of campus resources, and then persist to graduation. And then we'll hear from Christine and Kevin, who will share insights from their institution's transition to distance learning and the methods that they've used to keep their students engaged. And then to end, we're going to turn the question back to you um, to, in the audience and give you the opportunity to share some of what's top of mind for you. And so um, as we're having this discussion today, please continue to share questions or comments with us using the chat function or the Q&A box. And so now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Ross O'Hara. Uh, Ross has been a behavioral researcher at Persistence Plus for the past six years, where he applies his expertise in behavioral science to develop scalable interventions that improve college student retention. He regularly contributes to Psychology Today, where he writes a monthly blog called Nudging Ahead, as well as outlets such as The Evolution, People Science, and most recently, Educause. His work on nudging has been also published in peer-reviewed open access journal for the uh, American Educational Research Association. So Ross, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, everyone who's attending today's webinar. Very excited to have this discussion with you about improving student engagement. So as Serena mentioned, you know, if we think about what was going on four months ago, on March 6th, the New York Times reported that the first US college, the University of Washington, would close their classrooms due to COVID-19. And in the headline, they stated, quote, more could follow. Of course, we know that all of them did follow. And by 20 days later, March 26th, we saw over 14 million students at over 1,100 colleges move to remote instruction. And so in that time, all of you who were part of that, you know, moved mountains in order to make that transition as smooth and as efficient as you possibly could so that students could continue their learning but keep their uh, health first and foremost. And in that moment, there was just so much information students needed in order to continue with their education. They needed to know how remote classes were going to work. They needed to know uh, whether this was all going to affect their financial aid. Some of them had to move out of dormitories. Um, some of them needed technology. Someone mentioned that in the, the chat about trying to get technology to the students so they could do remote learning. So much they need to be told. And so in that moment, there's this urge to just sort of inundate students with, here's everything you need to know right now. And so at Persistence Plus, what we saw from several colleges and several of our partners were two different approaches to this. One was the email blast. So here's an example of an email that starts with a message from the president of you know, support and concern, but then quickly moves into talking about how virtual student life is gonna work, uh, what's going on with housing. This email continued to talk about moving out and had several links embedded within it, both about college information and links to places like the CDC for more information about COVID-19. And while this email is very well written and serves as a great comprehensive source of information for students, if you're relying on this to get students to engage and sort of deal with all of the things they need to deal with in that moment, it's quite overwhelming, especially in a moment where students are under extreme emotional and cognitive duress. This is not going to instigate a lot of, a lot of action. Another link on here is to this college's dedicated website about coronavirus, and that's the other thing we saw from pretty much every college in this country is some sort of coronavirus website. And so here's an example of one of those that again starts with a great uh, message of support um, from the leader of the college, but then moves into information for both faculty and students on the same web, web page, links to frequently asked questions, an archive of every email ever sent about coronavirus, tips for staying healthy and washing your hands, and then I had to cut it off because there was so much. There were additional resources with links to the CDC and the WHO and so on and so forth. So again, it's, it's great to have these places that students and faculty can go and see all the information laid out. But if you're relying on this to be the one resource, um, it's not going to drive a lot of action because it is just so overwhelming information. And it really gets to this wonderful quote from 
a columnist from the Chicago Times named Sidney J. Harris. And I just wanna shout out that I got this from a, a student I'm working with helping her with a dissertation and I never heard this before. So it's always a good, good to help with other people's research because you learn things. The two words information and communication are often used interchangeably, but they signify quite different things. Information is giving out, communication is giving, getting through. And so in the wake of coronavirus, there was a lot of information being given out. And what we wanna to talk to you today um, from our expertise at Persistence Plus, as well as the expertise of our wonderful panelists is how to do communication that gets through. And then even take it a step further to really increase student engagement when you're communicating with them. And so what we'll be talking, I'm gonna share with you three tips about how to move from just giving out information to really engaging with students over the types of um, digital communication platforms that we have to use almost exclusively now. I'm gonna be talking a lot about text messaging because that's what we do at Persistence Plus, but these lessons can apply equally to email or apps or chatbots or whatever it is you use to communicate with students when they're away from campus. And just wanted to mention that if you want to learn more about this, you can sort of dive into this more at the link at the bottom. That's the article that I wrote that was published on Educause just on Monday, and Serena's going to throw that up into the chat for you. So you can just um, click that, have it open up, and you can read it when we're all done with today's webinar. But the three things I'm going to briefly touch on is to lead with caring, leverage two-way communication, and then turn that communication into engagement. So first, leading with caring. You saw in both the email I put up a couple slides ago and the website that they both started with messages from college leadership, you know, expressing concern for students and hoping they're okay. But sometimes when our messaging, even when it starts with caring, if it's then followed up with loads and loads of information and directives and links, that caring can be lost or ring a little hollow. And there was a person signed up for today's webinar who asked this question beforehand about, you know, what types of messages do we see the most impact from or the most engagement? And these since March have been some of the highest is when we just sent out a message talking about how much we care about students or we're here to support you without any advice or direction whatsoever. So this was one that's been going out to students at Triton College, just saying, no matter how you did in school this term, congratulate yourself for doing your very best. And so, we got an outpouring of response from students. There's lots of thank yous, I really need to hear that. Here are some more uh, in-depth responses with students saying thank you for your positivity. Triton College gave me back my sense of self. You know, I have a lot to be thankful for. And so sometimes you can really start to connect with students just when you send out a message that has no other purpose than to say like, how are you doing? It's all gonna be okay. And when you do that, you really start to build the digital rapport that you need in order to move your information giving out to true two-way communication where you can start to learn what's going on with students and get them to respond. You know, the number one uh, thing people said in that poll a, a little while ago was that students don't read messages or don't respond to messages. And to get them to do that, it really takes a lot of time and energy with developing that kind of rapport over e email or text message or whatever it is you're using. So once you have that two-way communication, you can start to ask students about what's going on in their lives. And one example of this goes back again to the technology. You know, so many colleges, especially community colleges, were concerned that students might not have at home what they need to do remote learning. And so we were asking across our many partners, many campuses, asking students, do you have everything you need to take online classes? And of the hundreds of students who said, no, I do not, we were able to dig a little deeper and say, okay, what are you missing? And these were our results that, you know, about two fifths said they have unreliable internet at home, about two fifths need a laptop, and then 10% or so each for lacking some sort of class specific software or having limited data on a hotspot or for those many students that we know, we're trying to do all this on their phone because their phone is their computer. And then because we've established this digital rapport, you know, we dug deeper with some of these students about what challenges you're running into with remote learning. And these are two examples we heard from our hosto students talking about, you know, professors not responding to them, which is totally understandable since we know the faculty were going through so much stress at the same time that the students were trying to move to remote learning and deal with their own health and family. And then students not having certain technical skills. Here's one who was told that their homework had to be turned in as a PDF and they had no idea how to do that. 
And then once you have sort of dug into like the student challenges you're, you're sort of expecting, many of you were on the lookout for technology issues, you can start to try to uncover like, what are the things you're not thinking about? What are the hidden barriers? And this is just one I wanted to point out to everyone in the webinar that we heard a lot in March and April, really encapsulated by the statement in the bottom right, I did not sign up for this. Just this absolute sense of this sort of unfairness that students believe, you know, I wasn't asked about remote learning, I didn't get a say in what was going to happen for the rest of the term, and I feel like I should have more options available to me than just go home and do this class from home. And I think it's something colleges really have to pay attention to as they are planning for the fall. You know, many of them this week, last week have been started to at least somewhat meet out, uh, you know, here's what's happening in the fall and making sure they're capturing student voice so you don't get another semester of students feeling like I had no say in this, I don't wanna be a part of this. And then finally, when we're thinking about turning communication into engagement, um, Serena is going to post up a, a link to a resource from our friends over at Ideas42 with a nice overview of different behavioral science techniques that you can use to in your communications to really get students to engage with it. The thing I wanted to, to touch on is that at Persistence Plus, we do a lot of leveraging behavioral science interventions with students to try to help them rethink their education and deal with all the stress that's going on in their lives. And, and uh, our partner at Triton, Kevin, who's on today's webinar, is going to talk a little bit more about that later. But you know, two examples I wanted to give you of different types of interventions that we've been really relying on since COVID-19 hit, now again with the social protests across the country. One is expressive writing. Uh, this idea that um, if you get people to write in detail about their emotions, it helps them identify those emotions and really process them and cope with them. And so we've been asking students to write about how they're feeling about coronavirus or how they're feeling about social justice uh, that's going on right now. And then, you know, we get some very uh, in-depth, you know, expressive moments from students that can help them cope. Another area is really relying on pro-social motives. Research shows us that students who go to college because they want to help their family, help other people, improve society, uh, tend to be more motivated and more resilient to challenges. And so not only do we in these moments of you know this tumultuous educational time where we're trying to remind students of their pro-social goals for college so they would stay motivated through remote learning that they might not necessarily love um, but also getting them to think about how they're being pro-social in this moment how are they helping other people get through coronavirus or how are they helping the social justice movement as a way to sort of keep them engaged with their education and how it all it all links together and so those are the three areas I just want to briefly touch on, but we want to leave plenty of time to get to our wonderful panelists today. And so with that, I'm going to quote unquote, bring them to the stage. We have with us today, uh, Dr. Christine Mangino, who is the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Hostos Community College in the South Bronx, in New York. Like many community college leaders, Christine was the first in her family to attend college, earning her associate's degree from Nassau Community College, her bachelor's and master's from Hofstra, and her doctorate in instructional leadership from St. John's University. And this past year, Christine was selected to participate as an Aspen Presidential Fellow for Community College Excellence. Our other panelist today is Kevin Lee, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Triton College in River Grove, Illinois. Kevin has a background in both economics and psychology and has been serving as an administrator in the community college space for over 20 years. His expertise includes developmental education, holistic placement, guided pathways, as well as assessment and evaluation. Kevin currently manages multiple federal grants, including Title III and V, and his work has been honored over the years by earning multiple national recognition. So welcome Kevin and Christine, we're so glad you're both here. I'm gonna turn things over to Serena to get our conversation going. Thanks Ross. Uh, Christine, we'd like to start with you. Um, going back to March of this year, Students at Hostos face perhaps the steepest challenge of any college students in the country, um, with Hostos being located in New York City um, in the Bronx. And you know, being largely low income and, and living in the hottest COVID hotspot in the world at the time. And when it became apparent to you that Hostos was ending in-person instruction for the semester, what was your first thought um, as to what students really needed to hear during that time? How were you engaging them during those first two days? first few days. 
Thank you, and thank you for having me. So, you know, we are um, part of the City University of New York, so we had, we were receiving directives from both the governor, the mayor, our chancellor, and our central board of trustees. So we were given, um, thankfully, a five-day reprieve to have, you know, there was a pause put on education so that the students can get um, what they needed, faculty could prepare to have their courses put into a distance learning format, their choice if they want to do it through Blackboard, through email, um, through video conferencing. And so it gave us time to get that going. Um, but in the middle of that, we also then were told we needed to close the schools down for the most part um, so that all of our other services were also going to be held. We needed to start focusing on how do we make sure that all of our tutors had a way of doing tutoring remotely and that they had the technology that they needed. We needed to make sure that all of our advisors had a way of connecting with students. And then more importantly, how do students reach out to the individual offices on campus? So, you know, we had a few hours when we were told we were shutting down that evening um, indefinitely to make sure that all of our websites were updated uh, for students. This is how you will reach us this is an email to reach out to if you don't get a response within a short period of time here's the next email that you should reach out to making sure that all the departments change their voicemail to have similar messages um, and then we had to start figuring out the, our tech needs for you know not just for our staff um, you know for the office staff and the departments to make sure that the administrative staff had the right technology to reach out and then for our students and what did they need and Thankfully, CUNY was able to secure a large amount of um, devices for students, but then came the issue as you know, some of the participants mentioned in the chat about Wi-Fi. They didn't have internet connection. And even though there were many companies giving it out, you know, there were a lot of caveats and it didn't work for all of our students. We have a large number of students living in homeless shelters. So getting free internet was not an option. So then it was working with our local foundation board to get funding to get hotspots and give it out to students. But again, everything was backwards. So time for that to happen. And then unforeseen consequences, we, students weren't able to get to campus, right? They would have to take subways or, you know, they weren't comfortable doing that. So our public safety offices and our VP for student development actually drove devices to students' apartments for them to come down and pick them up. Um, you know, so it was really about how to get communication, you know, get students to know what needed to happen. Um, we have a Cayman Clues that we started last year, which is a weekly um, bulleted points information for this week of what you need to know. And what we found those first couple of weeks of when we closed, that email was opened far more than any other emails that we had ever given out to students because they were really you know, desperate to get information as things kept changing on a daily basis. Right, definitely. And I think all of what you just shared there is really, you know, um, a lot of what we've heard from our um, other partners and, you know, just across the, the nation right now is mm -hmm. all of the hard work that has had to go into making that quick transition. And so thank you for sharing. And um, those in the audience, if you have any strategies that you've employed during those first few weeks, please feel free to share them as well. Kevin. Triton, like many colleges, had a lot of apprehension around whether the shift to remote learning could be done equitably and without harm to those students who were already struggling. As Christine mentioned, um, you know, all of the concerns that were coming up with their students, um, I'm sure your students had similar concerns as well. And so uh, we'd love to hear how Triton has worked with some of its various subcommittees to engage students who were facing the greatest barriers with online learning. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Just like many of you, follow the state's stay-at-home order, which was issued rather abruptly too in Illinois. The college was closed and we went remote on March 16. As Ross indicated earlier, one of the largest lessons learned is how quickly we realize the digital divide continue remains as a persistent issue for many of students. If students cannot get a hold of the technology they need, there's no learning. And that's just a very harsh reality. In fact, the term digital divide was first introduced in year 2001. After nearly two decades, the fact that we've seen so many students 
not having a technology they need to be successful, that truly speaks directly to the persistent inequality in higher education. Um, so early on, the main difficulty is really for us to reach students who need a laptop. The promotion of our technology loan program too, we have to take on a purely digital form. We have to rely on three uh, main venues to share that um, technology loan program with the students, which really includes emails, websites, and text messages through Persistent Plus. So your help was really timely and particularly effective. And in parallel to that, student-facing support service too, all of a sudden, they will switch all their service delivery remotely and online. That took a lot of effort across college. Um, although we did have some services that are done remotely, but uh, many departments have to revisit their own programming. They have to revisit the delivery mechanism. That took quite a bit of time and effort across um, the whole campus. Academic affairs too, mostly of faculty, who is the group that truly deserve all the credits in my mind. They have to adjust their classes in a, in a very short period of time to meet the needs of students. And early on, most of us are really concerned about minority and first generation students learning performance. As we know, having a structure and being able to continue to cultivate the engagement through this process was extremely critical in the learning and success. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Uh, turning back to you, Christine, um, as Hostos went through the spring and you're now well into your summer term, you know, what have you found has been most successful in terms of student engagement? And what have you learned about student challenges that maybe was a surprise to you? And how has Hostos been addressing those concerns? Thank you. I think one of the great um, resources that we were able to use was Persistence Plus. When, you know, within days of finding out that we were closing, you guys reached out to me to say, how do we help support this? Um, you know, and, and thank you to the Steve Funds for helping support our um, participation in Persistence Plus. But it, we, you were able to then reach out to our students to ask about the need for technology. So how you had mentioned a few minutes ago about how hundreds of students, you know, claims that they needed technology. We had 549 OSTO students that answered, yes, they need technology. And then you were able to give them the link to our website where they need to fill out a form to request that. So that was very helpful. And then also as students were struggling and didn't know where to go, they would text back to Persistence Plus us um, some real concerns that um, Serena was able to then share with me that I can then point to the uh, advisors to reach out to the students directly so that they were getting that help. Another thing that we found very helpful was the use of Starfish that students were able to go through there in order to make appointments for advisement or for tutoring. Um, and also we added some alerts in there for faculty and advisors related to COVID so that we were aware of what was happening for students. Um, our coaching unit, which is mostly our academic advisors, had created a hashtag Mo Monday motivation helping promote self-care for students. They had coaching corners, which were virtual walk-in sessions going through Zoom. They created a lot more instructional videos for students on how to do things if they couldn't go to person or to our computer lab to get the support. Um, we found that students, um, they would answer number, the phone number once they realized who it was. So <laughs> making sure that they knew the number so that either whether it was through text or through personal phone calls. So many of our offices said that it was really the one-on-one -on -one phone calls with students that made the biggest difference. And then some of the challenges that we found that, you know, not necessarily surprising, but still, you know, shocking, you know, the, the amount of students who, you know, were, had food insecurities and we, we kept our food pantry open through this whole time and still open through the summer. We partnered with a local restaurant that was giving out free meals and is still continuing to give out free meals. The number of our students who were sick um, and that came down with COVID and it would take them four to five weeks to fully recover before they could start participating back in class. Um, you know, I had one faculty of 30 students. She had 18 in her class over the semester that had come down with the virus. 
And our faculty, their needs for tech was surprising to us and it had an impact on students. You know, so where Wi-Fi issues were happening and it would take days before we can get, you know, cable vision or, you know, a company to come and address the Wi-Fi issues. So then students are reaching out to the college having issues about the faculty not being responsive. Um, and then the fear for online was the big one. I did not expect so many students who the moment they found out we were going online were looking to drop the classes. So, you know, thankfully CUNY pushed back the withdrawal rate to the day before finals started. So we kept telling students, try it, stay with it. Let's see what happens. Don't give up yet. You could always change it. And then going to a, um, a credit and no credit um, grading option for students also gave them the ability to try it out before they let their fear get um, in the way of them. And then I think the last one was just to be about, you know, how many of our students just didn't have a quiet space at home to, to work and to do their schoolwork. They had children that they were homeschooling. A lot of them were considered essential workers and were working crazy hours and then still needed to find time to do their own work. So those are some of the challenges. And then some of these solutions was, you know, we created emergency funds for students and, you know, a number of faculty and staff reached out to the college administrators saying, look, we're getting a stimulus check that we might not need, you know, we don't necessarily need, or we're saving all of this money on com not commuting to campus. How do we donate that back to the college so that those monies go to our students? So we were definitely able to do that. And like I said, the food pantry, and then some of the advisors talk to students about how to change the narrative. It's not about everything that was happening to us, but about showing how your resilience is helping you get through this. I think that was very important also. Yes, thank you, Christine. I know, yeah, working with you through this time, just so many challenges faced by students in, in the Bronx. And, you know, I do want to acknowledge um, one of the comments that came in from uh, Belinda talking about the challenges her college is facing with students in tiny rural towns. Obviously, between CUNY and Triton, we don't have sort of rural educational spaces represented here today, but we know that, you know, it's the same. There's just that digital divide and that disconnect. Um, yeah, I had heard from a number of campuses across the country where they were able to expand their Wi-Fi so students can sit in their cars in the parking lot and get mm -hmm. access. You know, that's not an option for us, right? So you know, how do we figure out other ways? And Christine, a question came in I thought we could just mm -hmm. answer right now quickly um, from Justin asked, uh, were you able to pull specific student data from Persistence Plus to get in contact with students who had concerns? So could you just talk a little bit more briefly about that we did together? Yeah, so normally we try not to do that, but in a couple of cases it would, seems really important that the students got in touch with their um, advisors in order to help them with their very specific concerns. So we don't normally do it, but in that case we do. Mm -hmm. but what Persistence Plus does give us is, you know, examples of how many students, you know, percentages of students answering, you know, some of their questions or some of the responses to give us a general idea of what students are going through and not sharing necessarily with the college. Thank you, Christine. Kevin, want to switch back to you. Um, you've long been a proponent of incorporating behavioral science into the, like the fabric of Triton's communication strategies and support. You know, we've, you and I have great conversations about uh, nudging and behavioral economics. So, you know, where have you seen behavioral science as being particularly important or effective as Triton has been trying to keep students engaged while they're remote learning? Of course. Um, having a background in economics and psychology, I think early on, I was naturally drawn to the new efforts in high ed of leveraging behavioral science to improve college success for students. Um, as, as some of you know, many recent studies in high ed have truly demonstrated how behavioral nudge can be leveraged to increase FAPSA competition, address summer melts, and increase retention and persistence. So um, when we first partnered with Persistent Parts last fall, in order for the team to justify the institutional investment, uh, we actually did a um, quasi experimental research study where we actually find that um, in fall to 2019, um, the first generation students who received nudges actually returned in spring 2020 at about 5% higher than those that did not receive nudges. Given this wonderful early success, many of us at Triton 
have now become a true champion of behavioral science at this work. Uh, in fact, we're working right now to uh, expand and strengthen our internal nudging advisory committee so that we can do better and bigger uh, in the future. I think one particular lesson learned about nudges is not only about communicating information to students via text, but we need to leverage um, the behavioral science principles um, as the piece that Serena shared with us earlier from Idea 42, I think those ideas are really worthy of further explorations. I think too, when it comes to the behavior not local context truly, truly matters. It's being able to share what your own unique individual has to offer and make that personal connections with the students. And also too, I think the identity of the students also matter. Uh, what I mean by that is the following. If we um, send a text that is scientifically calibrated and intended for returning adult, but that text got sent to an 18 year old that just finished high school, I don't think that would be psychological sound. It may not even ring true or echo align with the student's identity and therefore being able to consider students identity in our text message to them, then they are more likely to see the um, relations and how it um, becomes psychologically uh, sound in their subsequent actions and reaction to the nudges. Thanks, Kevin. I think you brought up a great point about keeping students' identity in mind as we're framing these communications and the types of support that we can provide for them. And so um, taking it to something that probably is on the forefront of a lot of people's minds right now, um, Christine, we've talked a lot about today about supporting students through the pandemic and what that transition was like. And so we wanted to switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the protests and the social movement that's been happening um, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, these events have surely affected your students in profound ways, but supporting them must be a challenge considering the protests began in between semesters and students aren't on campus right now. And so um, a lot of institutions can't um, engage students in the ways that they might ordinarily in this context. And so how has HOSTOS approached helping students through this time? Thank you. Yes. So we, yes, we would love to be on campus so we could bring everyone together and, and work together on solutions and actions and just, you know, sharing feelings. Our student success coaching unit has created um, weekly conversations through Zoom in order to create a space for students to continue conversations related to Black Lives Matter and again, social injustice. So some examples of what they have put out there recently are essential workers, anxiety as people of color is one topic. Um, next week they're doing Independence for Who and films on social justice and then the following week it's on color, color, colorism and poems and books um, related to social justice. Our student government had um, created a statement regarding racial injustice amid COVID across the nation and New York City and that has been um, endorsed by our Senate Executive Committee. And what they're doing is encouraging students to participate safely um, in protesting in what it also um, increase their education in the topic, signing petitions, spreading awareness, um, protecting themselves. And you know, along the lines of peaceful protests, our faculty and students created a video, um, which I know you're going to be sharing a link for, which really shares their under their belief of how we can protest safely from our homes by, you know, at nine o'clock every evening, lowering the lights in your home and taking your cell phone flashlight up to the sky until change happens. But that that's a way that you don't have to be out in those crowds of the pictures that you just shared. So those are some of the things we're also looking to create a town. Paul um, coming up with focus with the student government and figuring out what are the actions that we want to take as a college going forward next year. Great. Thank you for sharing and everyone I did share those links in the um, chat box and so um, perhaps as you're thinking through your ways to keep students engaged um, you might draw some inspiration from those as well. And Kevin, I know that Triton is currently working through what the fall term will look like for you all, um, as many institutions are right now. 
And so as you're thinking through that planning, uh, we know that a lot of colleges must have contingency plans for what um, could happen or what needs to happen in case there is a resurgence of COVID-19 um, that returns in the fall. And so we'd love to hear how you're thinking about being ready for the fall and intentionally designing um, for student engagement and support in a semester that will have social distancing um, and most likely some degree of remote learning as well. Certainly. Um, given the decisiveness of the executive team at college, in fact, last week, um, the college announced that most of our four classes will be delivered remotely. Um, there are actually many ways we can contribute, continue to rely on not just as a key communication and engagement strategy, uh, because some classes that may require on-campus meetings for the lab components, for example, uh, we'll have to rely on Persistent Plus to share some of our campus reopening safety protocols with the community and the students. I think that comes in really, really handy. And also too, because things are so fluid, everything is changing and shifting so quickly. I think being able to kind of scan the students' feedback in an effective way during this time are particularly helpful. So perhaps like Christine and Ross mentioned, conducting some really, really quick survey via text messaging to be able to assess students' engagement and preparedness would be very helpful in the fall as well. As the college works to switch back its services from online to on campus too, as many institutions are beginning to do so, we certainly want to inform our students as quickly as we can so that there be no gap or disruption in our service delivery so that they do not have to suffer any uh, gap in the service that they so depend on. Great, yeah, it will be, um, you know, we're gonna be seeing lots of different situations across the country since obviously, you know, what, how coronavirus spreads and, and what happens is not going to be uniform, you know, in different areas. So uh, there's so much, so much to plan for. And so thank you for sharing your thoughts, Kevin. I uh, just wanna to say to the audience that we're getting very close to the audience Q&A section. So please, again, in the chat or in the Q&A box, have your questions ready for Kevin, Christine, Serena, or myself. Um, but before we get to that, just want to end uh, with one more question for our panelists, which I'll ask to both of you. You know, based on the experiences you've had in these past four months, what's the biggest piece of advice you would share with our audience today about what they should be thinking when, about when they are doing their own engagement plans for fall 2020? So Christine, let's start with you. What is your, your biggest takeaway people should get from today? I think use the time we have now to prepare, right? So instead of five days, we now have the summer. So we currently have our faculty working with faculty mentors and faculty instructional designers to create their courses in Blackboard so that there's some kind of um, a sense of, of similarity between the courses for students so that they're not trying to figure out all of these different platforms and systems that each faculty is using. Um, we have a course for students called Are You Ready that they can take to see what they need to do to be ready to take online courses for the fall semester. I think, you know, something that we learned is just how many different systems we're all using across the campus to have video conferencing and meetings with students and how do we streamline that so that it's not that many more systems that everyone is learning. And then I think, you know, another really important one is to figure out how do we create more spaces for student engagement and community on campus. So this past semester was more about survival, but next semester, how do we make sure that our student clubs can have their events in virtual spaces and we have other activities for students so that they really still have that sense of community for the college and also within the cl their classroom so that they could still create those friendships and relationships mm. with it's with their faculty. That's great. We know how important community is to uh, staying, in, staying in school, whether it's community college or four years. So definitely something everyone needs to think through. Kevin, what about you? What is your sort of final thought for the audience? Um, I would echo Christine's message too. I think uh, when it comes to communications, I think simplifying would help. Having too many um, communication mechanisms would just confuse students. So in fact, more communications does not equal better communications in my view. And I think my advice is not to over communicate. There's always that um, you know, um, uh, mistake sometimes we make. 
I think our messages to, to the students ought to be wise, concise, and at the right amount. Otherwise, it can lead to communication fatigue and lead to negative effect. The worst thing we want students to do is um, shut down and avoid our email or text entirely because they're getting so many of it. Keep in mind too, our students are already probably getting a lot more email this, this time from their faculty. So we certainly do not want to think that adding more communication is the right way to go. That's great advice for everyone. So as we move into letting the audience ask their questions, but right before we do that, I'm just going to share my screen again and get up this. Um, you know, we really want to leave all of you here today with, you know, not only a bunch of wonderful advice that came from our panelists and we thank them again for all of their insights and guidance, but sort of some more directives, like what could you do today, this week, next week to try to uh, improve the ways you're communicating and engaging with students who are off campus. So just, you know, a call to action. You know, one thing you can do is just go back to the last mass communication that was sent to students, whether it was an email or a text message or anything else, and see how it compares to what you've learned here today from this panel. You know, does the message lead with caring? And is that caring, you know, prominent or is it swamped up by a bunch of other information and messages, you know, does this mass communication, is it focused more on just giving out information or is it focused really more on student support? And does this inspire two-way communication or engagement in some way? Is there some sort of call to action to the students? And if so, you know, are there many calls to action? Is it hidden at the bottom of the email? Um, do you really think, you know, students, or you might know, you might have the data in front of you to know whether or not students really did respond to this communication. And just think about how that could, you know, when the next mass communication is coming out about fall planning, how might it be revised to reflect these lessons? And then second, you know, think about that next communication for students. Um, one way to think about engaging communications, first ask yourself, what don't you know about students right now that you want to know or feel you really need to know? And how are you going to get them to respond to a message that's engaging so that way you can find out this information, just as we shared with, you know, learning about students' challenges with the technology or remote learning. And if either or both of these sound like um, a little too daunting for you after just learning about some of these concepts for 45 minutes, um, we at Persistence Plus are providing three of your colleges or organizations the opportunity to get some free behavioral science consulting from me. Um, so there's a link on your screen. Uh, Serena is also going to throw that into the chat. It will also be in an e a thank you for attending email that you will receive in the next 24 hours or so. And if you go to that link, uh, you can just do a brief survey so we can learn more about you and what sorts of challenges you're having with communication and engagement. And as I said, um, three people who s do that survey will be selected um, to get a 30 minute consulting call uh, so we can discuss those issues and give you some guidance on doing your student communications in this for the fall. So with that, let me stop the sharing again. And we will get into our Q&A. So first, I just want to, oh, I see the question, will this PowerPoint recording be available? Yes, they will be. Um, so we can knock that question off right away. Uh, second, I did want to go back. There was a question from uh, Julia where she asked Kevin if he could say more about nudges to first gen students. And I saw you, were, you replied in the chat to this, Kevin, but I thought in case people aren't seeing that, it was still a good question to answer about, you know, how is Triton using nudges specifically with first generation students? Absolutely. Um, so the um, persistent plus nudges actually, uh, as I mentioned, they're scientifically calibrated by leveraging um, all these behavioral science principles. Uh, there are many, but I'm not gonna go into that. But obviously there's other um, fields uh, at the science that we can borrow. For example, we are also driving uh, some of the growth mindset by borrowing from social psychology. We are also leveraging social norm to kind of shape and improve student self, uh, self help seeking uh, behavior. So these are just some of the example. I'm sure Ross is more equipped perhaps to kind of add to it and elaborate as well. 
Yes, I think, you know, that's a very good overview. I know um, at Persistence Plus, we do work at a lot of campuses specifically focused on first generation student success. And it's an area where we've uh, been able to very effectively nudge students to engage with campus resources and to persist. And so um, I talked a little bit about pro-social motives, and that's just an example of an area um, based on research by Nicole Stevens at Northwestern University, who's looked at a lot of research on first-generation success and how first-generation students tend to have more of those values. I want a degree because I see this problem in the world that I want to fix, or I want to bring this back to my community and my family, make their lives better. And so that's something we really try to tap into with, with first-generation uh, students. Um, there's another really interesting area of research uh, related to Rebecca Kovarubius, I'm probably messing up her last name, so I apologize, um, about first-generation student guilt and this feeling of guilt over having these educational opportunities that, you know, their parents didn't have and also the sense of, you know, that their parents may be sacrificing or they could be working and contributing back to the family and instead they're going to college and different ways um, that have been shown in the literature to intervene and sort of alleviate those feelings of guilt and let them focus on, you know, short term, yes, you might be withdrawn from your family while you're doing college, but long term, you know, huge benefits to your family from doing this. Great. And so um, we have a question from Sarah who said that she really appreciated uh, what Kevin had shared about communication fatigue. And so um, maybe we could start with Christine. Um, what Sarah's interested in learning, what some, are some strategies for communicating effectively, concisely, and creatively? And, creatively. and so um, we know, Christine, that you had shared a lot of strategies that Hostos um, has been engaging in. So maybe you might have a few other things you could share around that. Sure. I'll share a little bit more about our Cayman Clues. Um, it's something that we've, we're finding has been very successful. It started um, last fall. As a way, it was our solution of how do we get information into the hands of students at the moment that they need it, right? We were trying to do orientations prior to class school starting. You, you're dumping information at them, and it, they have no way of connecting that to understanding what it's supposed to, why it's important. So each week we send out an email blast. Um, we put it on social media. It's on our, our website ongoing each week. And we'll say, you made it to week one and we'll bullet three or four things that they need very specific to that week and then week two and then week three. And then in some of those weeks it would be about, hey, there's a, a basketball game this Friday night. Did you get tickets? Or have you joined a student club so that they have ways of um, engaging? But then there's facts in there. You know, next week is the last day to withdraw from classes. Did you go speak to your advisor, you know, if you're thinking about withdrawing, things like that. So that has been one of our most successful modes of communication. Um, and then social media, they've had Instagram live sessions for students. Um, you know, we're, we're trying everything, but, you know, the overwhelming thing that we've heard on campus is phone calls. It's that one-on-one -on -one phone call. When the student finally does pick up, it's being able to communicate with somebody to get specific information for themselves. Great. And Christina, I was wondering for the audience, if you could tell, you've mentioned Cayman Clues. What is a Cayman? So that is our mascot. So it's, it's an alligator, crocodile type of uh, animal from Puerto Rico. Okay. <laughs> I just thought people might be missing, like, what is she saying? <laughs> uh, I just thought that was a good, you know, also for, you know, Kevin, you brought up kind of those issues initially about um, sort of the good communication strategies. Do you have anything to add to what Christine was sharing? Certainly. Um, I think during the most immediate crisis that we see as society right now, the pandemic and the uh, social unrest actually have quite a bit of uh, lessons for all of us. Um, so let me explain. I think during this time of pandemic, isolations we really call our, our own individual desire for relationships and I think too in particular the peer relationship if it's formed with structure and um, infused with the um, coaching and mentoring that can truly truly help students and work magic so as we talk about communicating to students I also want folks to kind of not to forget 
about their peer relationship that is particularly helpful um, for their um, educational uh, achievement. So then therefore, we can start thinking about, can we do more outside class group work in this time of isolations? I think there's a lot to be said about that. But also I want to tie back to what Ross said. You know, can we really leverage social justice, the race inequality to drive data engagement and connections through civil engagement? Because earlier Ross mentioned that many of us do have a desire to be pro-social and help each other. How can we leverage that particular individual desire to help students to achieve a greater economic um, educational success, I think there's some lessons learned and bad within our current crisis. Thank you, Kevin. A question just came in from uh, Rochelle, um, and I think either of you could very effectively answer this. Um, she says, my institution primarily serves adult students. Can any of the panelists address strategies they have found effective for communicating and engaging adult students in this new space? Um, I think, you know, Serena has shared data with OSTOS about the students who are responding to Persistence Plus on an ongoing basis, and they are our adult students um, and our transfer students. It's seen, you know, they, they value, the, they understand how important it is to ask for help and to get information. I think so there's lots of ways to do that, but Persistence Plus through the texting has definitely been um, a positive strategy for our students. Yeah, I would, I would say to everyone listening that, you know, when people talk to me about Persistence Plus, which I mentioned operates through text message, um, their mind seems to always go toward, oh, well, yeah, 18, 19 year olds, they text all the time, but what about adult students? And uh, we've been doing this for years and the, uh, the adult students engage a lot over text message. Like it is, um, so if you think that it, you know, something like that, texting or other types of forms outside of email are not going to work for your adult students. You are completely wrong and you should explore those avenues. And Kevin, do you have something to add? I know Persistence Plus and Triton also work together looking at adult students. I think having worked with so many adult students over the years, um, because they have very complicated life, some of them have to take care of their uh, children or even uh, parents then therefore being able to infuse some of the time management you know, strategy uh, would be very helpful for them. And also too, just because they're older, when they sit in class with a whole bunch of 18 year old, I think that social belonging also matter for returning adult students. Absolutely. Um, we have two minutes. So I'm gonna ask one more question that came in. Um, so that came in for Christine. If, if you could talk a little bit more about supporting students and forming community and connections with each other and their peers, especially looking forward to this fall and how you're not gonna be able to bring people together. I, one of the ways that we've been very successful is having peer leaders in our developmental ed classes or our math and English classes. So they continue through this past semester um, doing Zoom sessions with the students and they were helping guide the students, not just in the academics, but in the tech issues and in the you know, sharing of college information. You know, that peer to peer is really, you know, they value that. So that is a good way for us to do that. And then just continuing with, you know, what we found is when we first went back online after we had our five day pause, faculty said they had 100% participation in their classes those first few weeks. Students were desperate to make connections. So how do we create spaces, you know, remotely for students to continue those connections outside of class also? We had faculty that created WhatsApp, um, combinations with their students so that their students could either communicate with each other without the faculty as part of it, or some faculty did it with them as part of it so that they had other ways of communicating outside of the classroom space. Absolutely. And so being conscious of time, we're um, at an end now. And so I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. I think it was a really great discussion. We know that there are a few other questions um, that have sort of come in at the end. And so, um, 
please feel free to reach out to me or Ross. I share our contact information or visit our website at www.persistenceplusnetwork.com um, if you have any other questions. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Kevin, so much. We really enjoyed this. Um, and we hope that everyone has a great afternoon. Um, and please don't forget to fill out our survey if you are interested. Um, that will be included in our follow-up email to you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye. -bye.